good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody on this beautiful day. And we are gathered for worship today. We want to especially welcome those of you who are our guests today. If you're visiting with us, uh, maybe it's your first time here. Maybe you've been here multiple times. We've tried to reach out to you. We'd like to do that again. Uh, we have a registration pad that's on each pew to the light green pad. Please find that and please sign it. Let us know you're here. If you're new to us, we're new to you. Please give us a way to get back in touch with you. Maybe your phone number or email address, either one of those would work. Uh, but members sign in too. We'd like to know who's here today. We've got several important things coming up in the life of our church and I want to let you know about it. Uh, on April the 22nd, many of you are aware of this. There will be a, a special celebration of life for uh, Reverend Dr. Henry Blunt. He served here for a while, served around the state, and many of you were blessed by his ministry and know that. And so that Saturday at 5 p.m., our choir will be joining with First Methodist of Alexandria's choir. And so there'll be some really good music there. And so we invite you to be a part of that. And there'll be a time of food and fellowship afterward. And so we invite you to that. In our life of our own church, uh, this afternoon is the, uh, the meeting, our uh, special call church conference. And it will be this afternoon at 5 p.m. to make a very important decision about our church's affiliation or disaffiliation from the United Methodist Church. So if you are a professing member, uh, you are welcome to come and cast your vote for that. Uh, Wednesday Night Live continues this week. Uh, it will be Salisbury Steak and mashed potatoes. So come, there will be an adult class offered at that time if you want to stay afterward. Choir practice is afterward. And of course, we have youth and children's programming afterward as well. And then next Sunday, uh, many of you are so good to give blood every time, and it helps us in our blood program here and in the community. So the Life Share Blood Bus will be in front of the fellowship hall beginning at 9 a.m. next week. So um, a lot to think about, pray about in the life of our church. This year you come and let's sing our fellowship song that we are together. Good morning. I invite you all to stay and greet each other this morning as we celebrate being a part of this wonderful branch of the family of God. Sing. 
It's hymn number 568. And as the light of Christ enters our worship area this morning. today, those who are making end-of-life decisions for their loved ones. Lord, we pray for healing in their lives. We pray for your will to be done. Lord, we pray for those who are traveling on the road, especially this weekend. We pray that you will give them safety and bring them back to us. And Lord, as we continue in this worship <coughs> service with singing songs of faith, giving our offerings, opening your word, and applying it to our hearts. Lord, we pray that you'll move and touch us in every way. You'll bring comfort to those who are discomforted. You'll bring hope and healing to those who need it. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us
As you are able, please stand. Let us join our voices together as we share in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in her righteous father, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Join me down for a <laughs> So you remember the egg, right? What was the egg? It was, it was empty. Good, Olivia, it was empty. Well, let's talk about the disciples. You see, the disciples didn't know right away that Jesus had risen. They were probably upset. They were probably sad. They were even probably a little afraid. Nothing had turned out like they thought it would. I think they were probably very afraid of what would happen next. After all the traveling, the teaching, and the miracles, Jesus had died. And they thought they were left all alone to figure things out for themselves. You know, this kind of reminds me, I was thinking, as we were talking, I was thinking about when I was a kid, I used to go out to, um, in the summers, I would go out to, whoop, to a summer camp up in the mountains, and we would go out and we would sing songs around a campfire. And then you know one of the things that we talked about? We talked about something a little bit scary. We did ghost stories around the campfire. So we told ghost stories around the campfire, and I can remember saying, there's no such thing as ghosts. There's no such thing as ghosts. Just to try to make myself feel better, right? So that I wouldn't be afraid. Well, let me tell you something that happened to the disciples that was probably a little bit scary. You can find out more about it in Luke chapter 24 if you guys want to go home and look it up and read it yourselves or ask your parents to. It begins with two men traveling along on a road to Emmaus. Can y'all say that word, Emmaus? Um, yeah, that's a hard one, huh? They talked about Jesus' death and all that had happened, and then all of a sudden, as they walked, somebody else came and joined them. Well, they didn't realize at first that it was Jesus. They were so excited when they realized that Jesus had joined them that they ran off to Jerusalem to tell the disciples. Well, you see, the disciples were all in a room together, and they were talking and telling about this, and all of a sudden, Jesus appeared and said, Peace be with you. You know what they thought it was? They thought it was a ghost. They didn't understand that Jesus was real. That he had come back just like you and I. He was real. And so he showed them his hands and let them touch his hands. They still didn't quite believe. And so you know what he said? He said, I'll tell you what, ghosts can't eat. So give me something to eat and I'll eat that in front of you. And so he ate in front of them. And then he realized, they realized the joy filled their hearts and filled their heads. And they were so happy because they suddenly realized Jesus was with them. It wasn't a ghost. He was real. He came back for real. They were so excited. They were so overjoyed. And they knew what? Guess what? They knew they didn't have to be afraid anymore. Well, you know, we know that Jesus is real. We don't get to see him. We don't get to touch his hands. But we get to see him in the hearts of other people, right? So we get to see Jesus in that we get to see how other people show us what Jesus is like. Isn't that pretty cool? And because of that, we don't have to be afraid like the disciples were because we know he was real. Isn't that cool? All right, let's pray. Let's thank God for Jesus. Lord, we're so very happy and thankful for that you are alive. We're especially glad to know that you are always with us and that we don't have to be afraid that we know you walk this earth and you still walk this earth in our hearts. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Vassar.
Well, at 10 o'clock this morning during the Sunday school hour, at the beginning of it, I had the privilege of meeting with several of the parents of our confirmands. Uh, confirmation will be on the first Sunday of uh, the first Sunday of May, and so I know you all want to plan to be here for that <coughs> joint service we have every year. It's a great celebration. I was meeting with those parents though because we take the time uh, I do each year with each confirmand to plan a time for me to sit with them in my office and let them ask any questions that they may still have about the gospel and, and about their need to accept Christ in their lives or whatever questions and I get some kind of, uh, uh, I, questions I didn't expect uh, with some of them, which is good, but it also gives me a time to ask them individually about their decision uh, to say yes to Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and profess that to you as a church and also whether they want to be baptized into the membership of this church. And so um, it's a great time and it's part of that uh, confirmation process that begins and I just want to thank all of you who are part of that. It's a weekly process and it takes a lot of time and I want to thank the prayer partners too of these 11 confirmants. I'll let you know that's coming up as a great day of celebration for our church. So, your gifts and offerings and your attendance here help to make that possible as well as your prayers. So our ushers will come now and we'll receive our offering today. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the ongoing work of our church. So many hands and feet that do that. They meet every week with our confirmands. They instruct them about the love and grace of forgiveness of God and Lord about the salvation that is afforded to them. And Lord we pray that you'll continue this great work. We thank you for those that give and the way that they support this and those that pray. Pray for our confirmands every day in prayer partner form and also just as general people in our church, pray for this process. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Well, as a society, we're kind of fixated on the idea of security. I don't know how your house is secured, but you probably have some kind of system, whether it's just a simple lock, or you may have cameras around, or those motion sensing lights or whatever. It seems like as soon as we earn enough money to buy something that has value, the next thing we're doing is figuring out how, how to secure it so no one takes it, or to secure our family and ourselves to where no one breaks in. So this is something that, you know, is a, a major industry. If you invested in this years ago, you probably did pretty well with your investment because it's one of those industries that just continues to, to grow and diversify. Not only uh, physical security, like locks and cameras and things like that, uh, but also our identity. That's something that has to be secured as well. So many people hire a company, some companies like LifeLock or ID Shield or Norton, and it's to protect that social security number of yours or that bank account number of yours to where it doesn't fall in the wrong hands. All of this is about security, feeling safe and secure. Now the disciples were experiencing some of that same insecurity uh, on Easter Sunday night. And we talked about Easter Sunday morning last week and about how it was Mary Magdalene who stayed there at the empty tomb when Peter and John had gone there and were sort of confused. John said he believed something happened. He doesn't tell us what he believed, but Mary Magdalene was the one that stayed. And it was Jesus who told Mary Magdalene, look, I've got a message for you to give to my disciples. So Mary Magdalene, in fact, became the, last, the first post-resurrection evangelist. She had a message to share with the disciples that Jesus had risen from the grave, that he was here, he was alive, that he was waiting for the ascension to God the Father. What glorious message that is. What a glorious message that is. I mean, you think about how remarkable that was during the first century when rabbis would not trust women even to teach the Torah to them. They didn't trust them. But here, Jesus trusted Mary Magdalene with her life and how it had been turned around by God to give this message to the disciples. So that's where we are. She has done that. She has given that message to them, and yet they're still afraid. They're still locked in a room. And so if you have your Bibles, let's listen to the Word of God from John, the 20th chapter, verses 19 to 23. And if you're able, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. And the disciples were overjoyed when they said to the Lord, and Jesus, when they saw the Lord, and again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. But if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The 20th chapter of John, along with some other passages from the other Gospels, record this remarkable first Easter Sunday. We talked about the morning last week. We're going to talk about the rest of the way a little bit today. The fact that this day began in darkness. The darkness was not only because it was pre-dawn and the women showed up there very early before dawn, but also the darkness was inside them as well as they were suffering the grief and terror of what had happened to their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and coming to do the very grim task of re-anointing, re his body, because it had to be done so quickly. 
So there is darkness there. But then as the angels appear, as Jesus appears, as he talks to Mary Magdalene, everything changes. Suddenly they are uh, enlightened by the fact that Jesus has conquered death and sin in the grave. And so they begin to realize this. But it doesn't stop there. As uh, Miss Leslie pointed out, later that day, two disciples were walking to the little town of Emmaus, about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. And as they're walking, they're joined by what they think is a stranger, and they begin to talk. They don't recognize that it's Jesus. And one of them, Cleopas, invites this stranger to stay with them, to have supper with them. And so as Jesus breaks the bread and blesses it, that's when they realize, oh, it is the risen Christ who is with us, and he disappears. So they go back to Jerusalem. They go back that seven miles again, and they tell the disciples again, there's another eyewitness. We've seen the Lord. Jesus has been with us. He had supper with us. And you think that would solve it for the disciples. Now they know. They've heard it from Mary Magdalene. They've heard it from these two disciples. But then there's another sighting. The Gospel of Luke tells us that Jesus appeared to Simon Peter during that day. Doesn't give us any details about that, but Simon Peter. And yet they're still locked away in fear. Isn't that amazing? We can have these close personal encounters with Jesus Christ, but yet we can still carry fear in our hearts. We can still carry that despair sometimes in our hearts because we fail to believe and realize that Jesus is present with us. Now you would think that there in that upper room and there were 10 disciples there, Judas was gone, and Thomas was gone for some reason. Maybe Thomas was the only one with the courage enough to go get food for the group. We don't know. We don't know where Thomas was. But there were ten disciples. You would think somewhere along the way that they would remember the words of their master. Because he had been telling them during his entire earthly ministry that he, the Son of Man, would be taken to Jerusalem, would be taken, uh, arrested, would be abused, would be killed and would raise again. But no one remembers that. He told them that in Caesarea Philippi when Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And he blessed Peter for saying that. But then he told them what was going to happen with him. He told them that after the Mount of Transfiguration, they had this incredible um, experience with God and with Elijah and Moses on the mount. And as Jesus is coming down from the mountain, he's telling them, i got to go to Jerusalem. I'll be arrested. I'll be betrayed. I'll, you know, all of that. I'll rise from the dead. Still, they didn't believe that. It's amazing how they, many times, they had been told that, yet it never dawned on them. They were so steeped in the horror that they had seen before. They were so steeped in their own fear about their future. Have you ever been like that? Have you ever been afraid of your future? Have you ever been able to not see with hope beyond that locked door? Well, that's where they were that night when they were meeting together. So how would Jesus respond to this when Jesus, of course, comes through that locked door and comes into the room? What would he say to them? You bunch of losers. What are you thinking? What are you doing here? Didn't I tell you? Then would he say, where were you when I was on the cross? Because as far as we know, only John was there at the foot of the cross. The rest had fled. We know Peter denied him three times, and so we don't have a record that Peter was at the cross or any of the others except John. So would Jesus scold his disciples? Instead, Jesus walks into that room, that room of gloom and darkness, and says, Peace. Peace, peace be with you. Shalom. What a beautiful picture that is. I hope you didn't miss that. Where, how do you picture Jesus in your mind when you fail God? When your faith fails you? When you fail to speak out against something you know that's untrue? When you fail to take a stand? over something that you hear, that you know is hurtful to someone? How do you feel that Jesus would respond to you? Here he walks into this room, to these 
disciples who had clearly failed him. And he says, peace be with you. I hope that's the picture you have in your heart, in your mind of the loving Christ, the good shepherd, the good shepherd who goes after the one sheep when the 99 are all in place and he goes and seeks until he finds that one lost sheep and brings him home on his shoulders. I hope that is the picture you have of the same Jesus who says, peace be with you in the midst of your darkness. I hope that you sense that presence of God when you are falling away from Christ or whenever you have done something that fails him, some sin in your life that you have succumbed to. I hope you can remember the prodigal son who returning to his father doesn't just uh, get let back into the house, but his father runs to meet him. His father puts a, a ring on his finger, fresh shoes on his feet, and the best robe because he welcomes him back into the fold. That's what Jesus does with his disciples here. So he says twice, peace be with you. Jesus wants us to have peace in our lives, but he also wants us to have joy in our lives as well. And so it says the disciples were glad. They were overjoyed. And the word there in Greek is chireo, which is where we get our word hilarious. In other words, they were overcome by joy. They were just filled with joy that Christ was there with them, that everything was going to be okay, that now it was clear to them. It all came together for them, what Christ had done for them on the cross. So we can, uh, we, we didn't read this part of it, but of course Thomas was not there. And we call him Doubting Thomas because he doubted, you know, well maybe it was because he felt kind of like an outsider. I mean, his disciples are going on and on and on with their joy. Well, he wasn't there. He probably felt kind of like odd man out, you know, for that. Don't know. But they were overjoyed. But he didn't say to them, hey, this is a good space in here. Why don't y'all just read in here every Sunday morning from now on? He can sing some psalms. He can share some testimony and some word. Maybe hear the word preached. But I want you to just stay here in this room. It's comfortable in here. You can lock the door. It's safe and secure. This is a good spot for my church. No, he does not tell them that. He says, as the Father has sent me, as the Father has sent me, now I send you into the world. In other words, that door is going to be opened, and you're going to be out there preaching the gospel. You're going to be out there giving people hope and life and healing. You're going to be out there doing what I did for three years and you watched me and you participated with me, feeding the hungry, out there healing the sick, out there praying for and laying hands on the blind so they can see, out there raising up people so that they can walk, out there preaching and teaching to the crowds that I am the Lord Jesus Christ. Out there going into not Jerusalem, but Judea and Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the world, you're gonna be sent by me to be my hands and feet. That's your new job. That's what I was here to do in the first place. Now he didn't say, well, folks, you know, since all of you guys have the same mindset, since you all the same, have the same political views, and the same social views, and the same, you know, you think alike in every way, that's why you're going to be my hands and feet. That's why I'm going to send you forth, because you're all so much alike. They weren't. It was a zealot in the group, a person who sworn to kill Romans and Roman uh, collaborators. There was a Roman collaborator in the room, Matthew. There were people who had different viewpoints. 
different ideas, different ideologies, different politics, but they all came together to be the hands and feet of Jesus. They moved together in one as a mission from God. But Jesus didn't say, you've got to do this all on your own, under your power, with your talent, with your ability. No, this next thing we find is that Jesus breathed on them the Holy Spirit. The Hebrew word for that is the same one that's in Genesis when God created Adam from the, the, the minerals of the earth and he breathed into him the Holy Spirit. The Hebrew word for that sounds like breathing. It's nefesh. Um, and so, I'm sorry, it's ruach. Ruach, which means breath, but it also means spirit. So he empowered those disciples to go forth and do that work. It wasn't the baptism of the Holy Spirit of the whole church. That would happen in the book of Acts, and we'll celebrate that on Pentecost. But to this small group that needed power that day, ruach, he breathed in them the Holy Spirit. And from then on, and the other Gospels record this, especially Luke, they did move out. They did move out of those doors, and Peter went back to fishing, and they did get out there until the Holy Spirit would come. They would gather back in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit. But now they had the power to do that with God. So that's how it needs to be our prayer. That we not only realize that we are sent forth as the continuation of Jesus' ministry in healing, in touching, in proclaiming, in witnessing, but that we have the power of the Holy Spirit since the day of Pentecost to do those very things for God. And so that's our job. That is our commission. That is our mission to Pineville. And no matter what our sign says out on Highway 165, no matter what our stationery says that we are as a group of people, we are, in fact, not that. We are the hands and feet of Christ on mission. We are the ones God has empowered to go forth and spread this gospel light in spite of whatever decision we make today. We are one in Christ. Choir, I want to thank you for singing that song. That was kind of a spring it on you thing, but you did a good job, and I thank you. That song, So Send I You, is directly from this passage. So Send I You. And it was written by a lady who you would not probably think would be writing great songs. Her name was Margaret Clarkson, She's a Canadian. And as a young girl, she felt God's call to be a missionary. You know, go to a foreign country somewhere and spread the word of God. But the thing is, Margaret's health was not good. And it was not recommended that she go to a foreign country and do that. And so she felt somewhat like a failure, like her health kept her back from serving God the way she felt called to serve God. Instead, she trained to be a school teacher and was sent to a remote lumber camp in a, the area around Ontario, Canada, somewhere out in the wilds. And there she taught school. And as she taught school, she realized she was doing exactly what God had told her to do. She was being the hands and feet of Jesus as well as she could. There in that school, she encountered these children who very much needed the light of Christ in their lives. There at that school, she encountered these families so far apart from their other families that they needed the light of Christ and the hope that she could bring through her teaching. And so, she realized one night that she was exactly where God had sent her. She was being the light of Christ, the hands and feet of Christ in that lumber camp. And she began to write a song about how she was sent 
and how we are sent as well. The choir sang it, but I'd like to share with you the words here. So send I you to bind the bruised and broken, or wandering souls to work, to weep, to wake, to hear the burdens of a world aweary. So send I you to suffer for my sake. So send I you to loneliness and longing, with heart a hungering for the loved and known, forsaking home and kindred, friend and dear one. So send I you to make my love alone, to know my love alone. So send I you to hearts made hard and hatred, to eyes made blind because they will not see, to spend though it be blood, to spend and spare not. So send I you to taste of Calvary. So send I you to bear my cross with patience, and then one day with joy to lay it down, to hear my voice, well done, my faithful servant. Come share my throne, my kingdom, and my crown. As the Father hath sent me, so sent I you. That is the commission for every Christian. That is the commission for every church, no matter what our label no matter what is outside, we are sent to be the hands and feet of Christ. Amen. Father, help us to remember that in any decision that we make. Lord, that we are called to be your people, to love one another and to love the world around us. Lord, may love reign in our lives. And Lord, we pray that as we go forth from this place, you will Help make that a reality in our lives. You will show us how you empower us each day through the work of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we will claim that power in our lives and we'll go forth to be your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to share a hymn that talks about this. It talks about Christ and his humble service and how we are called to have that same spirit within us. It's number 581. And if you have a decision to make today, maybe you'd like to just come down and pray for your church, and these rails are here for you. If you maybe have never trusted Jesus with your heart and life, you want to say yes to him today, I would love to pray with you about that as well. Or if you just want to come and rededicate or, or come speak to me about anything, I'll be ready to hear you. Let's stand as we sing number 581.
love and grace. Help us to remember that we are your representatives. We are ambassadors for Christ here in this community, here in this world. Lord, help us to live that out each day in our actions, attitudes, and the things that we do and the decisions we make. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Join hands and hearts together as we sing because he is.